And welcome to uh, the next session. Uh, it's rapid uh, fire, well, at least for two sessions, um, because uh, our next speaker is already lined up and you have already met her um, because she talked about uh, the Rio de la Plata in beautiful Buenos Aires. Um, and indeed, it is uh, quite amazing how little the river in Buenos Aires is part of the daily life of the city. Uh, whereas uh, typically uh, cities uh, spring up around um, rivers or uh, uh, on river mouths, uh, so where they end up in the sea, which is also sort of like the case for 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 Buenos Aires. Uh, sometimes, indeed, cities turn their back on the river, and Buenos Aires, yeah. in a way, is one example. But it's not the only one. Uh, Brussels was mentioned um, uh, as one of those as well. And here in Sao Paulo, it's also very much the case. Um, Sao Paulo is built on a bunch of hills. Um, and most of the streams have been uh, encapsulated by concrete. But Cecilia is not going to talk about the river. <laughs> She's going to talk about the city. Now, Cecilia, key less. I can talk I'm about the city. river if you want to, guys. <laughs> There is a lot to oh. say about this river. It smells so bad, guys. It's, oh. It really smells so bad. Yeah, yeah. But, so I mean, maybe not about the river, but if you, if you must, right? But let me introduce you first. Um, yeah. She is based, as you know, in uh, as you now know, in the really gorgeous city of um, uh, Buenos Aires. As uh, some uh, famous inhabitants of the city uh, would use, used to say, the Big Apple, um, mm -hmm. uh, which is, of course, also a nickname for another big city uh, in the same uh, hemisphere. But uh, uh, it's also used for Buenos Aires um, in Argentina. And uh, Cecilia in Buenos Aires currently runs Graffiti Mundo. And Graffiti Mundo is an organization dedicated to increasing awareness of the rich heritage and dynamic culture of Argentine street art. And she also is uh, the gallery manager and curator for Galeria Union, which also is in Buenos Aires. Now, Graffiti Mundo was born out of a passionate desire to connect more people with the amazing, and really is amazing, street scene of Buenos Aires and to document the cultural and historical context of the movement, expressing protest through street art. Um, I, was introduced to, I was introduced to Graffiti Mundo a few years ago when I visited uh, Buenos Aires and I went on one of their tours. Uh, and if, well, you'll see uh, some of the beautiful uh, work uh, that you can uh, visit, you can go and visit in Buenos Aires today. But I believe that uh, Graffiti Mundo also is now hosting online tours. So wherever you are in the world, you can actually, uh, uh, well, virtually experience the streets of Buenos Aires. And with that, uh, I hand over to uh, Cecilia. Thank you. What, an, what a lovely introduction. <laughs> I hope you had fun on your tours. I, <laughs> we never talked about that. Anyway, so yeah, we've been working for more than a decade with uh, um, and like the local urban artists and, and we just began to work with them even before we knew about any street art scene in the world. So we actually, um, I am Argentinian and I was introduced to all this amazing world um, in the hands of two English friends who I met here and, and we became friends and they had met here as well. And as they were just, and just sightseeing around the, the city, they uh, found um, all this at large scale at murals and pieces. And, and eventually as they just run into the artists and they ask the artists, okay, so, um, and so who's the sponsor for this? You know, it's a lot of material and the artists were like, no, no, no brands, no sponsorships. Like we are the only ones who are actually just paying for this. And it was at about just 2 at PM in the afternoon. And it was like, oh, okay, so, uh, and you do have like the permission of the government just to paint on this huge park. And they were like, no, like no authorities no government, no guys, like, <laughs> this is absolutely independent. My English friends were sort of like in the mindset of you are painting in the public space. Why don't you have permission? And why isn't anybody just calling the police? And they were like, why would they call the police? We're just painting. We're not rubbing a bang. So <laughs> it was all like, a, uh, uh, uh. like, we don't get it. We don't get this place. Like, what are you doing? So um, it was very strange for me as well as all my friends 
we're actually just talking about a street art scene in the world. And if you just Google like street art scene in Buenos Aires, um, in the in the 2008, nothing came out. So we actually eventually we became friends with all the artists, and they also just began to introduce us to all these other artists and just sharing all the stories and their motivations and their techniques. And they just even they just taught us as to cut a stencil and how to paint it and how to work with a can of spray paint, for example. We are not the artists, even though in Graffiti Mundo. We were also just used to at working in, in, in agencies, uh, in photography, in art history. So we all just began to investigate what is going on in Buenos Aires and what had been going on in Latin America as a whole, in South America, um, that we don't consider to paint on, um, on the street and act of vandalism. It was it mainly all about uh, that issue. So we began also just to work with a lot of organizations, introducing them over to the artists and also just helping the artists to work on commissions. Uh, and it was actually just one, an idea of one of the artists, why don't you guys run a tour? and sort of just walk around with all these people and just showing them and the materials and the stories behind the scene and your investigations. Uh, as we just began to interview a lot of activists and other artists who were just painting in the 60s, in Buenos Aires, in the 70s, in the middle of the dictatorship as well, and just risking their lives. So we just began just to make sort of like a, like a script of of like a narrative of um, of like the predecessors and and the word just graffiti was not on the book you know the uh, the letter based type of graffiti so I will just tell you all about this guys and um, and we just want this to be an interactive just participation so if you have any questions or or comments please and just if we just to jump in okay. Um, I cannot see a lot of, of your faces right now, so just jump in or just leave any questions in the chat. So, um, as I was telling you about, uh, one of the artists was like, I, and, why, and why don't you guys just run a tour? So my English friends were like, okay, we're not going to show all the Argentinians their own country in Spanish, and let's just do it in English first. So a lot of hotels and agencies just became interesting in this and we're not an agency and we and we had never just worked with tourism before and so that was something very new so and we just want us to share the story with as many people as we could uh, in Galeria Union we also organized artist-led uh, at workshops on stencil uh, on letter-based graffiti uh, on collage da, da, da. so uh, and we also just made a documentary uh, in which you can actually hear and see all the artists just talking and not our pretty faces. Uh, and they just tell, you know, all their story of art and activism in public space. So, and let's just talk a little bit about uh, the contemporary urban art scene in Buenos Aires nowadays is a direct product of um, and like the city's turbulent history and tradition uh, of art in public space. It all began, guys, with actually, and with the Mexican just muralism, not with the graffiti scene and just coming from at New York, no. In the 1930s, this guy, Siqueiros, David Alfaro Siqueiros, have you heard of him? No? Okay. He was an amazing... <laughs> an amazing just muralist. Um, and what happened with him is uh, in those times in Mexico, the artist had a role. And it was not like the role of just painting just pretty things. No, it had just the role just to communicate over with the audience uh, all the conflicts of the working class, for example. So he took exile here in Buenos Aires in the 1933, and he was just uh, and by the president of the time, and he was like, we're very honored to having you here, sir. 
but I'm afraid you cannot stay in the capital city now. You are a very fiery man. You have a, a lot of amazing ideas. You are not shy about them. You love to communicate them and you cannot paint here. So he was like extremely offended as his idea was of course is to paint all this at large scale at murals in La Boca. La Boca is a, is a part of the city in the south in which, in which you had uh, all the port. And that was like the door into the city of all the Italian immigration, for example. So it's like the origins of the working class and the anarchism and the socialism in Buenos Aires. So he had in his mind, I want to paint there. And they said no. And again, no. And again, no. So a very rich man, he just took him under his wing and said, OK, you're going to get into trouble. And only a couple of weeks after his arrival, uh, the first of the, um, of the military regimes began in Argentina. So he was very upset. Instead of painting a mural, he went with his friends, and these were part of his friends. <laughs> this is Antonio Berni. He was very young at the time, an amazing Argentinian artist who just flogged around him. He just heard, this guy is in town, we need to meet him. So uh, he helped him just to cut all these angry messages on stencil and to paint them all around the area of the Congress as a vandalic act, of course. Uh, and instead of having any spray paint, because it was the 33, uh, and they just filled in all these cans of insecticide with all this amazing just mixture of paint that he just brought the knowledge okay it was all just synthetic paint and that and they just constructed it and <laughs> of course there's no photograph of this it was a vandalic act and it's all in their memoirs okay so instead of um of just leaving like a mark of muralism he left a mark of using stencil as a means to protest a vandalic act on the streets and for example I am showing you now, this is an amazing piece it's by Antonio Berni in the 34, uh, as he used a like portable canvas and they just unrolled this portable canvas. This is the canvas and they just took it over to marches. So instead of painting these murals on the streets, they just took it to marches and they showed it everywhere and just directly to the public. Then they, and then they just roll it back up and took it home. And this is another one, and which is called The Unemployed. And so just face also, I would like the impossibility of transplanting all this large scale public muralism into the country. Uh, Siqueiros instead adapted to all this local uh, environment and introduced the, uh, the technique of the stencil instead. So, and let's just talk about the stencil right now. This is the work of Santiago Spirito, and he signs as Caballo. You can see him over there. He's just painting over there. And let's talk about him. Um, he was an architecture dropout, okay? So he knows how to cut something with an exacto knife. Um, and he was working at a sushi bar in which he met another friend and this friend he told him you need us to come out at night with me and let us paint all the stencil amazing stencils that i have and he was like what's the stencil this is you've never heard of a stencil never okay exacto knife this is a print of a design uh, of a photograph i edited it on photoshop i printed it and now we just trace it on this pvc um on this plastic and a stencil uh, has any of you guys ever used a stencil before Ah, oh, you did all you vandals. I can see you, Baba, you're using a hoodie. <laughs> you look suspicious. Okay, so <laughs> a stencil, you could cut it on cardboard, on paper, on plastic. It all depends how many times you just want to spray it. Okay, so um, after his turn on, on the sushi place, they just paint um, uh, the stencil of his friend at night. And this is how he just began just to be involved in this, you know, in the night, in San Telmo, it was a bit like sketchy, and they just painted a stencil, no one cared. 
No one ever stopped them. No one ever just made them questions. So on the morning after that, he could see like some additions over to the stencils. So he just loved, you know, the, the, the and like a game in between him just leaving a mark and someone just making like, I don't know, a message or painting something instead of painting over his stencil and just painting next to him and next to him and next to him. So, um, and then the country hits again and we have the crash, uh, the economic just catastrophe of 2001. Has any of, it, of you guys ever heard of what happened in this country in 2001? Well, I'm not able to see you your faces okay there was a huge <laughs> i'm just into the computer just trying to find your faces uh there was a huge um <sighs> a collapse in our in our economies in the 90s the peso was paired over to the american dollar just one to one so in the 90s the argentinian it could afford to travel uh, and your flat it was priced at the same price as a flat in paris and we could afford like French perfume, in came sushi, in came cereals, in came the MTV and, and or like much music and, and rap and hip hop and, and we had never heard of ever before. So in the 1990s, for example, um, all the graffiti writing uh, and like the Beastie Boys uh, uh, and rap music and tagging of trains, it just arrived in the 90s, only filtering into all these kids in the middle class, but we'll get there. So in 2001, there was like a massive running into the banks and our financial system just collapsed. It was as bad as, a, as the president just escaping on a helicopter. And you can see like, you can hear um, and like gunshots from people over to the, over to the helicopter. And we had five presidents in a week and a half. I cannot remember all their names. It was massive. No one wanted to be like accountable for any of this. So all the banks began to close um, their doors um, and going back to, to their countries. Uh, of course, it's taking all the people's lifetime savings in US dollars and they never came back. So unemployment was massive. It was it was sort of like, I don't know, like a horror story. So uh, in comes the crisis. Uh, and what happens? Everyone just goes back to the streets as a place to, um, and just to protest. And of course, then you had, for example, like the PVC uh, and the Cavallo used just to cut, you know, his stencils. It becomes unaffordable as it was imported into the country. And the cans of spray paints are unaffordable as they were Spanish. So instead of changing their techniques, uh, he begins to adapt, okay? Uh, and the face of this man, for example, he cut it on an X-ray sheet. So they just flock around hospitals asking for uh, like the donations of the X-rays. If you like apply yeah, bleach, it becomes transparent. So of course they left their numbers and the hospital just ran them. Here it is. And they just pick up like layers and layers of X-rays. So. All this, for example, the face of this man, all this, all this that I'm just pointing out here, all this are actually x-ray shaped because of this. So instead uh, of only painting this, he begins to use all the wall uh, as a collage, as a huge this mural in with stenciling. But I just want to go back a little bit and show you this. It's always been um, a, a very familiar thing, of course, like the Mexican type of muralism and what happened in the 30s. He grabbed a photograph of a march uh, from the 30s and he replaced um, the, the yeah, roller um, and a brush. And this is a march of painters as he invented and it's called We Want Paint Now here. And this is a part of the flea market. And he just showed up in the middle of the day with all his stencils and a cigarette. And he just began to work on the, on the place. It was an area under construction, so no one would mind. 
and people in Buenos Aires, instead of just calling the police, they just ask you like, okay, so what are you painting? Do you know that my cousin also paints? Oh, that's a lovely color. It's like, yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> it's much more just the time and that the artists like spend right, just talking to people and that painting. So this is another one. And this is a huge stencil just by Randon Walk. So of course, it's not only just one layer of stencil. This is a lot of just tiny layers of stencil. So the important thing is that the, um, uh, the stencil was introduced into the country and it was also just used um, by the Mussolini, um, the, the, uh, the party as a way of promoting like themselves. You only cut it once and you can paint it over and over and over again. If you have the time and the permission or you're just cheeky enough just to show up and paint, you can manage this very just complex works. Any questions, guys, so far? Oh, don't be shy. Okay, so let's talk about like the real vandal in our mentality. It's this guy's under lettering. This is all the political writing. This is actually the first of the groups, um, and just to start a painting on the streets uh, without any permission was in the 1950s, all these painters working for um, all the, um, uh, the political parties, okay? They receive money from the richest uh, political parties, and just below the table, of course, uh, and their job is just to paint the name of the candidate uh, as a president, okay? This was our, um, our president just before this one, <laughs> this is Macri, in the color of the party and just jumping over to their van and hitting like the next wall, okay? If you ever paint over them, they will paint right over you, you know? It's, it's sort of like a, a mafia uh, uh, thing. So uh, all the artists that I just mentioned just before, they don't need to paint over anybody. Instead of painting over someone, why don't you just look for another wall to paint, okay? So instead of painting over them, they just started just to make fun of them, okay? This is a stencil of a very famous guy who is actually like an activism for the cannabis and a comedian. His, his name is, is Tommy, oh, does anyone remember? Okay, and a musician. Uh, so he just painted him uh, with a stencil gun. Whoops, I'm sorry. And this is actually an image from an advertisement magazine uh, of the 60s. And this is a boy who actually had a remote control on his hand. And this is a work just by Stencil Land. And he just placed the, the, um, yeah, the brush as if this very bored boy had painted and promoted a candidate as a president for the next elections. So how, and how can you do this? This is very high, okay? So uh, this artist, he lives and works around the area of the Congress and he saw a lot of, of scaffoldings as they were just fixing the ceiling. So in the middle of the day, he just climbed up the scaffoldings and he just began to paint the boy. So this is a lot of, of uh, they make fun. It's not all about just protesting and protesting. So in the aftermath of the crash of 2001, it's actually when all the street art scene in Argentina began, okay? As a way just to reclaim uh, all, all that had happened and sort of like the country for the people, okay? Uh, all the institutions had failed us, all the banks had failed us, all the, um, um, and the president and the government had failed people. So their message it was very um, strong, okay? This is a mixture of how bad it was. Uh, this is an image uh, of Carlos Brigo. He's an amazing photographer and and he let us use a lot of, of his photographs on our documentary. And this is a skater just hitting this, um, what do you call this tank? And uh, the ones that just throw up like water just to people who were protesting. This is actually a photo just taken in the 20th, yeah. 
okay, in the 20th of, of, of December. Of course, he was making no harm with a skateboard over to a tank, but this is how, how powerless people uh, felt, okay? And this is another very creative way of protesting. It was called El Mierdazo. I'm sorry, it's a bad word, but it's all about throwing excrement to uh, the Congress people, okay? They just called in for people just to bring their own excrement or their dogs, whatever, and just to throw them over to the Congress doors. And it says, let them all just fuck themselves. A shitty politician, shit, 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 okay. And let's just throw like shit over to uh, the congressman. Uh, this is how creative it gets, okay? Uh, and this is a stencil, and it's called the Disney War of Buenos Aires, uh, a stencil in with, um, and with the war in with Afghanistan just began also. So what happened is that you had a lot, a lot of, and like the streets began to suffocate it with all this negativity. It was all about like, you know, uh, fuck them all. We all hate politicians, banks, da 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 da. So in the other area of the countries, a lot of unemployed just designers were sort of like fed up of having all the crisis shown on every single a wall and street in the city. So instead, they grabbed all their friends um, and their coins and they just bought it latex paint because it is like the cheapest paint and it is made here in the country and it endures um, on the exterior. So instead of just painting angry messages, let's paint something that says nothing on politics, like nothing, okay? So also just without any permission, on on a Saturday morning, for example, they all, all just showed up onto parks. Uh, if there if their walls uh, were very just gray or dirty or just neglected by time, and because of the crisis as well, they were like, and let's just work here in the open air and let's enjoy the sun and hang out with friends and and let's just like drift over to you know we are just and we're just painting, yeah? So this is an example of a collaborative at work. And this was all spontaneous, uh, no sketch. And all these guys, they just began to paint all their characters uh, from their own animations. And they also had other stencil friends who were also sort of like fed up of the negativity. And this is Random Walk and Random Walk and his cat. It was all about just playing around the other friend, not just covering uh, them up. So about permission. This is actually a, a part of the city, which is a residential area. It's in, 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 in Vicente Lopez. Uh, and the funny thing is that it is um, a part that a lot of people just walk past. It's uh, on the side of a highway. So the artists are just constantly just hunting for walls, okay? And one of these guys had just spotted all this like um, large wall and it doesn't have a lot of traffic over here. So, you know, it was perfect just to paint. And they were all unemployed, okay? They were all just grabbing like paintings like for other jobs and, and, and just gathering any color they could have. So they just showed up and they faked a permission. They were sure someone was going to like uh, stop them and make some questions, so they were prepared. All these guys are very professional in their works. They have other jobs. They are amazing designers and visual artists, so they know how to work with clients. They're very serious, straight faced. Um, they were not using like any hoodies. Uh, one of them had even taken their dog. And as they were going to spend like two or three days working on this wall, they faked a permission. So, and they began to paint and with latex paint and, and, and ladders and, and no scaffolding. Um, and they just began a painting and a policeman stops them and asks, uh, and can you show me like your permission? Yes, officer, here it is. And it was signed as a pop singer from Uruguay, Jorge Drexler. And the guy 
you know, he was very happy, like he had his copy and another copy just in case, and he just, he just folded it. I'll keep an eye on your car. Thank you, officer. Like he never checked, you know? They were very serious. They were very friendly. They came fully prepared. They had a permission and that's it, you know? <laughs> you know, his job was covered. And this is how they ended up just painting this, and which is like not offensive anyway. And, um, and this one later on, they have permission on here. This is a factory. But I just want to show you that um, and by this time in 2011, all these artists who had, who were actually uh, self-taught artists, they had begun painting on the streets as an exercise in university. And they've spent like more than a decade um, and just working together. So they love just to construct things all together. It looks like if just one person had painted it and it was three in this case. So what about the graffiti? Okay, in, in other parts of, of, of the world, for example, in Europe and the States, the parent of the street art scene is actually, uh, or the graffiti writing, right? And, and, and the hip hop scene um, and the rap scene, which actually just began uh, in the States uh, in the late 70s and the painting of the trains. Okay, here in Argentina, uh, in the 70s, we were uh, suffering the, the, um, uh, the toughest of the military regimes. So we heard nothing of what was going on outside of our tiny bubble. And then of course we have like the Falklands War in which you know, uh, the media just became uh, much more just concentrated in the people not having any information from the other parts of the world. So um in the 1990s in with the peso was spared over to the dollar we found out what had been going on in the world and we could travel so all the graffiti scene actually uh, this guy is dano and his tag and the first time he ever saw a tag was at the back of a cassette of the beastie boys and he was like what's this <laughs> okay and then he heard all this amazing a new music, and so he just grabbed his friends, for example, Franco Fasoli, and which is jazz, and this guy who is Pastel, they were only 16, and they were like, okay, let's, you know, let's use a hoodie, let's go paint out at night, it's cool day tomorrow, let's find a park, and mom, I need money for spray, a spray paint and spray cans. As spray paint was imported into the country, it was almost unaffordable. It was very expensive. So they were middle class kids and they were not vandals. <laughs> so they began just to play uh, in the streets. And the neighbors were like, what are you doing? Why are you painting at night? If you're just painting, what? why are you covering like your face and your head? You're not robbing a bank. You're a kid. Go home now. It's school day tomorrow like, no, I'm a graffiti writer. What's that? You know, you cannot even like read that. If you just want to paint something, why don't you paint something nicer? So um, um, it was sort of like um, a niche information, okay? In Argentina, it meant no harm, uh, no vandalism. It was, um, it filtered in. So no one had, no one feared like this guy at all they were kids so some of them and they just continued to paint graffiti and others like franco fasoli uh they haven't and and let's go over to the next artist this uh, is francisco diaz uh his nickname is pastel as he got that nickname when he was just graffiti writing as a kid he was only 16 year, 16 years old and his friends were like why don't you just come paint with us uh, later on, he went into, into university and he became uh, an architect. Um, so this is, is when he began to uh, wonder uh, and, to, and to study and to investigate how we inhabit the, um, uh, the spaces where we live and what's the impact uh, and that the human is living uh, in the spaces in which we are living, in the cities, in the countryside, like wherever. 
uh, he also noticed um, and that graffiti writing was uh, something that just caught in like his attention of the urban landscape and what are we doing injecting something into into the space in which we all live so it all changed for all these guys after after uh, the crash of 2001 they realized they had been just playing with you know the the, uh, the use of public space and they were very young um although all this was a space that people had just fought for uh, and the democracy and the freedom so it just blew up in his in his head and he said i will paint something and they would inject into the community i won't just paint only what i want and so he just um and before he paints he just studies all the plants and the um environment and the culture of a space uh, and he says he doesn't want the urban artist to be sort of like a tool uh, of gentrification and that's happening nowadays he just wants to inject um is something into the community. And how's the time, Babak? Am I talking too much? Huh? <laughs> well, it, it depends a little bit on how much longer you are going. No, 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 no. <laughs> just only, only just two minutes. So as you can see on this, on this next image, you know, all the streets of Buenos Aires is, is sort of like, like a, a giant soup of graffiti writing. Of like friendly graffiti writing, just sharing space with other friends, and now just muralists and murals, and also the 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 um, injection of the Mexican just muralism is is very much alive today. Okay, and this is Red Sudacas. It's um, an arts collective who always works with the communities, and this is like a reclaim uh, of the struggle of the of the mothers of La Plaza de Mayo and which were the mothers of the disappeared in the dictatorship of the 76. And as a last note, uh, I wanted to share uh, this artwork as it really says a lot. Um, in general, in Buenos Aires, it is a very friendly scene. It's not about just covering each other, like graffiti writers covering each other and just fighting for like the same space. It is all about just the respect of the other artist and the other person and just learning from them. So I just wanted to show you guys, this is a community um, uh, at mural in which all the artists were invited and they were invited not to paint over each other, but just to paint next to each other and sharing information uh, and showing each other, you know, oh, this is an amazing brush, like very just geeky talks and and just nerdy conversations like this paint is amazing just go and try it out oh yeah you know um so any questions so far <laughs> well if anyone has questions yeah. uh yeah do jump in um but i would yeah, like to crystal thank thank you very much uh it's really nice to see uh, uh the work of um argentine street artists again um but there's a bunch of things that uh, come to my mind, um, not so much questions, but more like observations. It's very nice uh, yeah. that you connect uh, the street art scene to uh, stenciling, um, which is uh, uh, historically much more often used as a um, uh, way to s subvert, uh, to uh, specifically politically. Um, and that also you are showing that lots of the work uh, uh, prov provides social and political commentary. Uh, which I think is what uh, makes, particular in, in Latin America in general, uh, makes street art quite unique, because a lot of the street art is social or political commentary, much more so than it is uh, in uh, Europe or in North America, where it's more about ownership. By spray painting on a wall, you sort of like claim the wall. Uh, and that's why a lot of it is tagging or elaborate tagging in those places, like to a few of the examples that you showed. Um, but that might be, uh, I'm glad that uh, you showed one image of him. You asked before uh, whether we knew the Argentine artist Cisquero, but I did not know him. But before that, you showed a mural of Diego Rivera, who is often considered the, 
the biggest uh, muralist uh, in the world, um, who of course uh, was not only uh, providing uh, with his work uh, social and political commentary, he was also a staunch communist, right? And of course, uh, the troubled husband of uh, Frida Kahlo, uh, but that's a different story. Um, but maybe uh, it's uh, something Latin American that uh, street art uh, needs to, uh, from people's hearts or something, uh, provide social and um, political commentary. What I also really appreciated is um, where you talked about um, presidential candidates co-opting the street art scene uh, under the table, like not officially, but uh, but but still co-opting uh, the work and sort of like bringing that then into the mainstream. And why I think that's very interesting is because that's exactly, of course, what uh, I've what we see here in uh, Sao Paulo, where also street art is huge, um, although the social and political commentary is more often done through what is called pisasao, like writing in almost impossible to read. Uh, writing That's almost very impossible unique. to read. Yeah, it's yeah, extremely yeah. unique, like nowhere else in the world. It's it's yeah, yeah. it's a Brazilian thing. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and also you were point, you were talking about the scaffolding that people were using to paint. Well, the the, the pisa sound, the lettering on the sides of buildings. Uh, people really hang off the sides of buildings. They they climb to the top and climb down, uh, holding on to the lattice work, and sometimes fall down or hang by ropes. It's a uh, it's it's, it's all it's about the amazing. risk. Yeah, and there's like yeah. a hierarchy in graffiti writing. There's also like a hierarchy, and and in pitch there, it's a, a as harder and as much more dangerous as it is, you are like regarded as like, wow, like yeah, a piece The more God. respect you get. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but so Pisa Sao is not co-opted, but the the murals, like the ones that you're showing, they are very much co-opted. They're co-opted by the city, yeah? Because in Sao Paulo, there is no public advertising. All public advertising was banned some 15 years ago, which is fantastic. Um, but it means, as a consequence of that, many of the walls of the large buildings, or all the walls of large buildings, were, because of that, empty. They were just blank slates. So the city co-opted street artists to then paint these sides of buildings, but of course not with political or social commentary, because the local municipality doesn't want to hear of that. They don't want to pay someone to complain about the homelessness in the city. So it's all beautiful art. It's, it's beautiful. Uh, but it has, uh, they've, they've, how do you say this? They have uh, uh, taken the teeth out of, uh, um, of, of this work because it's now beautiful and no longer social uh, commentary. And uh, it's so powerful, no. you know, and that's the thing. Um, in some countries, they just try to control it because it is very powerful. You are mm -hmm. just connecting mm -hmm. like the message and, 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 and yeah. <laughs> I mean, you're like erasing art galleries erasing like a curation it's no. yeah and and it is like a very powerful thing and what happens uh, is, exactly. wait, i'll show you this guy is that he actually he could paint this in in a countryside house you know this very rich man he owned a newspaper he's like uh and just come with us and we just take you off the capital city and and he just took it over to his house um and which was a, a 15 acre house and all this like younger artists were also just living there and they had like amazing parties it was like really <laughs> over the top um and he sounds found very similar to Diego Rivera actually uh. yeah <laughs> and he found like a basement and he was like okay we are going to work on this basement as if like the basement is just a floating cube on the ocean and all these creatures could just come so it's actually painted on the ceiling, on the walls, and on the floor. And um, and I believe the owner of the newspaper, he became a lover of Cicado's wife. So, and then Cicado's, they exchanged wives. Uh, <laughs> and I believe one of these ladies is the owner of, of the countryside house naked woman over there. So um, it was hidden for ages, ages. And then um, as the owner of the newspaper died on, on a motorcycle, on a car accident, um, all this was sold. And a very rich people it bought it. And their child ended up being a minister 
of, uh, of security of the nation eventually. And her mom <laughs> was like, let's burn it with acid, okay? You could see naked people over there, burn it. And they just tried to burn it. They could not because the technique was amazing. And then they painted like cal, I don't know, like the meaning uh, on top of it. And just to cover it, they could not. And they just closed it and let it like, you know, it die <laughs> and it wouldn't. And it has like a very long story, okay? They just tried to stop it and they couldn't. <laughs> that sounds a, it's a yeah. good story. Uh, somebody yeah. needs to write an article about this. Um, okay, thank you very much, Celia. Uh, does anyone uh, have a, a question, remark, suggestion, thought uh, of uh, other listeners? Yeah, John. Now he's really raising his hand, or was that also an applause? <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh, thanks a lot for the talk. It was great. I really enjoyed it. Uh, oh, you. you touched briefly on uh, the question of gentrification, and I just wonder if you speak a bit more about that. Is, is yeah. that an issue within this scene? Because I mean, I, I'm currently based in London. I've previously lived in Berlin. And what, what you see is, particularly in Berlin at the moment, is a shut in the kind of like the squats which have existed since the 1970s and stuff. That the authorities use the aesthetic, the graffiti, etc., to promote the excitement of the city. Yeah which brings in the kind of capital to build the buildings, which like then they get rid of the the, the, the people who actually created that scene. Yeah. Um, you understand what I'm saying? Is, is, is this a yeah. problem with, with where you are or, or not? Is it linked to it? It's something uh, that really sort of like worried the artist as, you know, um, in the case of Pastel, he is a trained architect and he has worked for more uh, and then a decade in architecture studios and da da da, until he sort of like you know uh, he let go of of this job and and he became like a visual artist and and one of his jobs of like six months a year is just to travel the world on festivals, which actually invite him for like a week, and they just give him sort of like a eight story high or more a building and he only has a week. So as he arrives, he knows nothing of the community. He knows nothing of the story. He doesn't talk to people. He just makes sort of like a sketch. He just jumps in. He makes like shops for all the materials and he just and he just starts. So he was actually a one um, of the first Argentine artists to be like a verbal about this. And he's like, I don't like to work this way. I would just I just bring an idea from my house <laughs> or from like, you know, <laughs> the shower. I just show up there, I do my job and I get paid. And all of this, all this community, you will have just to live um, in with, you know, the, the, the artwork and that I have done. It's sort of like a violent thing. And also it makes it like nicer. It makes like the building it much more expensive. And he was like, I don't want to be a part of this, you know? So instead he just began and just to make, um, and like he stay it longer or the walls is smaller. And so he has a time of just researching uh, of the culture, of the, um, uh, of the town, of the community, uh, of the people and their food and like the visual just landscape because he knows and that what he is going to paint is going to be a huge input into into the city and he takes this is very just seriously <laughs> he is sort of it's very um and like responsible over on this so all of the rest of the artists have been just doing all the same you know and 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 just um and they just try to like avoid all, all these projects in which let's paint here because it's very ugly <laughs> and intact with some color and it's an amazing lovely area now you know and and it has happened a lot around the world and also in buenos aires as well all this like the the, the and like the violent zones in which like there's no light 
um, and let's bring in, you know, the artists and they will paint and it will feel safer also. So it's sort of like a very just delicate thing and and just being respectful, I think, is 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 one of of um, of the biggest worries, you know, as as they will be just leaving a mark to a lot of people <laughs> that will just, you know, live with that every single day. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, yeah. And maybe with that, uh, we should uh, wrap this up. Uh, thank you again very much, uh, Cecilia. Uh, it was lovely, guys. Thank you. Thank you.